the series uh, seems wonderful to me, and it's a treat to be the one who opens the series this year. Uh, inequality is a massive topic. I think it's uh, become one of the most pressing issues in the US and worldwide. Uh, I think our research barely touches on it, but I think it does touch on some issues that I think will be um, relevant to thinking about inequality, what it means and its implications, particularly for policy. So what I'd like to do, I'm gonna try to give you a sense a bit of how we got to the work on scarcity and what, you know, kind of the main theme of what we think we found. And then I'll discuss a little bit how I think it might be relevant to thinking about policy domestically and about issues of poverty more generally. So I'm, I'm gonna to try to go uh, from up, down, and then into policy. Um, in some sense, the, 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 the elephant in the room, which is what Senator Molinath and my good friend and colleague who wrote the book with me and I discuss, is uh, the poor don't look very good. And what triggered our research in some sense, if you're a psychologist, you are trained to think that context has an enormous impact on how people behave. And we try to understand what is the context of the poor inhabit and how does that influence and impact what they do. If you look around, uh, if you look at, med and, at health, for example, we've discovered some wonderful uh, drugs, medications to solve a lot of problems. All that's left is for people to take them. Adherence is a problem. And if you look at that literature, the poor are the biggest culprits. They fail to adhere, you know, controlling for accessibility and affordability and everything else, they just fail to adhere to the, medic the medical regimens. If you move to the fields of the developing world, weeding your field as a farmer can have big impact on your income and on your well-being. Uh, research has shown by development economists that poor farmers weed their field less than the richer neighbor next to them. Uh, parenting, if you go to Barnes & Noble, there's a lot of books on how the poor are negligent parents, they're less consistent in their disciplining, they don't spend as, time, as much time on their kids' homework, and many other illicit critiques of how the poor parent. Uh, in the world of finance, which is the one I know best, the poor look terrible. They make a lot of terrible decisions. I'll spend one second telling you about payday loans, which is the one that we uh, analyze a lot in the book. Uh, payday loans is one of the you know, dramas happening in the, America, in the streets of America today. Basically, if it's hard for you to finish the month, which I'll get to later, is true for about a third of the population, uh, you need a little bit of money, you can go get a payday loan. The way it works is you need a couple of hundred dollars before the end of the month. You have to be working, you have to be receiving pay to get a payday loan, because you basically give a check uh, that will be deducted from your income when you get paid. So you go uh, borrow a couple of hundred dollars from a payday loan provider, and basically you pay back at the end of the two weeks, 250. Now, uh, these are short term. If you compute the implicit APR, the annual rate you're paying for this loan, depending on who you are, it'd be somewhere between 500 and 1,000%. Uh, and the point is that if I didn't have $200 to finish the month this month, how will I have 250 to pay you back next month? And so um, what you find basically is that once I take a payday loan in order to pay it back, what do I do? I take a payday loan. So the, those who take payday loans in the US take an average of between 12 and 15 payday loans a year. Uh, and some of the recent research I saw, if you take a random payday loan given in the streets of the US today, 70, 70% 70 of it goes to pay the previous one. So we basically turned you into a money pump, taking enormous loans just to pay back the, back, the, the, the old loans, and it becomes a, a vicious cycle where it just gets very expensive to get nothing in return. Now, um, there is some research, it's controversial, it's not completely clean, but there's some suggestion that basically living in a place where there are payday loans reduces your access to medicine and other things, just makes your life less good because you end up being in greater debt. Uh, when you give people a loan at 500 to 1,000% APR and where the risk of, of non-repayment is relatively low because they're working, this is pretty good business. So how common is this? Here's one stat. There are more payday loan and check cashers in the U.S than McDonald's, Burger King, Sears, JCPenney, and Target stores combined. Now, if this doesn't compute for you, let me help you a little bit. Some of these stores have payday loan providers in them. So that kind of helps you see how this could possibly work out geographically. This is massive business. In case you are led to believe that these are little kind of shady businesses, 
There are many of them owned by the biggest banks in the US, like Citibank specializes in these. It doesn't put its name on it, but it makes a lot of money from it. It's a big issue. If you're going to discuss the role of regulation in the US, and, and this is part of what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is doing these days, this is one place where you really want to ask, is it okay for us to leave landmines out there for people who have no other recourse but to take them, or do we have some obligation as a society to cap them, limit them, do something so that they don't explode in people's faces who have very little other options? But this is the kind of thing that you see. Now, the question then comes, what's going on? Why would somebody who needs a little bit of money now take a payday loan knowing that next month they're going to have to pay it back and they're going to have less than before? And a lot of things have, brought, have been brought up, culture, education, lack of self-control, trying to explain why is it that somebody would take a, the poor would take a payday loan. And I'll come back to it in a little while. More generally, when you look at attempts to explain behaviors that you see among the poor, a lot of different explanations have been suggested. And the reason I'm putting this up here is to say, what I'm gonna say in the next 40 minutes does not intend to replace all of this. I'm not questioning the fact that there's educational issues, peer effects, neighborhood effects, no doubt they play a role. Okay, so I'm not gonna replace these. I'm gonna add one more factor to the analysis, one more thing we need to think about when we think about behaviors that we see in context of poverty, which is basically the psychology that occurs in context of poverty and how it might lead to or predict some of the behaviors that we see. Okay, so that's the agenda. Now, uh, the book that Senel and I wrote and a number of wonderful graduate students and postdocs uh, worked with it, the basic idea, just to preempt what I'm going to try to tell you, is that living in context of scarcity, of not having enough, basically makes you focus a lot of your cognitive resources, a lot of your attention on juggling the thing you don't have enough of. Let's assume for now it's money. And when you do that, there is just less mind left for other things you need to do. And when you took somebody in, in the context of poverty where a lot of their mind is spent on juggling the thing they don't have enough of, and there's less mind to pay attention to other things they need to do, and you put them in a context of poverty, bad things happen. So that's kind of the, the pressy of the book in some sense. Now, uh, we use a metaphor that to some people is sort of useful, so I'll talk about it. Think about going through life basically where your budget is a suitcase. Okay, so, so some of us have a large suitcase with lots of slack in it. Others have a very tight suitcase that's very hard to fit everything you need to fit. So think of this, you know, you, you're packing for a trip to go to Chicago for the weekend. You toss your massive suitcase on the bed and you start throwing things in the suitcase. Let's assume you're throwing them in decreasing order of importance. You toss 10, 12 things. You're not going to take everything in the house. You kind of got what you need. Didn't take you very long. There's room. You close the suitcase. You're ready. Now imagine doing the same thing with a very small suitcase. You start putting things in. By thing four, thing five, you're running out of space. You have to stop doing other things you're doing. You have to attend to managing this budget you have. You have to start asking yourself, is it more important than the boots or the coat? You become an expert on which shoes take more space in the suitcase rather than not. You are focusing on packing. And of course, once you travel, if anything goes not as you planned, you have very little slack, very little room in your, in your suitcase to adjust, to adjust, to add something, to do whatever you need to do. Things require your attention and they're more complicated. Interestingly enough, it turns out in, in theoretical computer science, it's actually the packing problem, which is very much about this, to add several things into a small bucket. Basically, it takes a lot more computational capacity than if the bucket was big. And so the other basically is that people travel through life either with a large budget where there is slack and there is ability to do things sometimes with little planning, and others are traveling with a very small budget where everything needs to be very carefully choreographed. Trade-offs become a very big thing. The relative size or cost of items become a big thing, etc. Okay, that's kind of the metaphor we use, and I'll touch on it again. One more thing in the book that's very important for the book, but I'm not going to spend much time on it today, as, well, as Ines mentioned, the psychology of scarcity doesn't have to be only about money. So I will spend today, because this is a talk about inequality, and that's most of the interesting research we did. But just to give you the intuition, many people in this room are, mon are time poor in ways that are very similar to the way that our subjects are money poor. You just don't have enough time in your bucket. And what happens then is that some of the things you do are very similar to what the poor do with money. So I have a very good friend who works very hard painting houses. He works very hard nine to five, then he's done. If you ask him, do you want to go to the movies tonight? He says, what's showing? Many people in this room, if I said, do you want to go to the movies? You ask what's showing and you think, what will I not do tonight that I meant to do tonight, I'm going to have to do tomorrow. You're in a trade-off thinking mode because you have a tight suitcase. 
Um, one of the things that happened with the poor, when, you have to, when your budget is very tight, is that things that for most of us are standard and no big deal become luxuries that need to be resisted, temptations. So having a, an expensive coffee at Starbucks, which some people do without thinking twice, for others is something that needs to be carefully considered. Paradoxically, people who are time poor, things that ought to be standard become a luxury. So some people who are very time poor in the US are very successful. If you consider spending a couple hours with your children at the end of the day, as a standard thing that a successful person does, Paradoxically, very successful people who are time poor have turned spending time with their kids into a temptation that needs to be resisted. Because there's too much to do for tomorrow. Very similar effect. Um, a very, very common critique of the poor is that although they're sitting on debts and budgets they cannot afford, they're still spending small amounts on little luxuries. And my question to you about time is how many of you here are sitting on temporal commitments, on deadlines, that you know are going to be very hard to come but to, to respect, in which case, what are you doing here schmoozing with me? You should be you know, back there doing some more. Very similar psychology. And you can see how it goes. So this is one thing. This is a different. I need some break, and everything deteriorates. In general, more generally, it's much more consequential when you have a very tight suitcase and something goes wrong than when you have slack. When I forget to pay a parking meter, it's a bummer to be hit with a ticket. When somebody who has a hard time finishing the month gets hit with a parking meter, the month gets a lot more complicated in ways that are much more impactful. As it turns out, we know quite a bit, people who are living with relative scarcity of money, and this let's go back to money, encounter a lot of very, very serious challenges in a predictable and consistent and frequent fashion. There's a lot of studies of this kind. And basically what this says is when you're living with scarce resources, you're going to be hit with a lot of problems. And how many people experience this? Enormous numbers. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but as you might know, poverty in the US is officially defined as having less income than the poverty line. The poverty line, without going into the details, is a number. In Europe, for example, it's not a number. It's 60% of the median. But here we have a number. It could be 18,000 or 21,000, depending on where you live. If you're below it, you're considered poor. As it turns out, most organizations that look at the living wage, what you need to live a minimally acceptable life in the US today, arrive at something close to twice the poverty line. So when you read that 50 million Americans are poor, what you're reading is that 50 million Americans are below the poverty line. In fact, a little over additional 50 million are getting less than 50% above the poverty line basically makes them almost impossible for them to finish the month. So in the most successful nation in human history, about one in three people basically are in a fretful zone of being completely poor or very, very close to it. These are the people who take payday loans. It's over 100 million people. This, by the way, is four or five years old. It's probably worse. Okay, so this is where we are. This is, these are big numbers. This is, when I say the poor, by the way, from now on I'm going to use the word poor in a very vulgar fashion as if I know who they are and as if they're not here. Many of us qualify. Less than others, but many of us qualify as people who, graduate students, needless to say, don't really count because it's like your numbers fit but the rest of your life doesn't. But, you know, people who really have a hard time finishing the month. One more comment that's important when you do this work. There's often a critique that comes typically from conservative circles that say, what are you talking about the American poor? All of them would be middle class if you put them in Chennai, India. They're living it well. So I want to address this for one minute because it's important. When I describe these 100 million Americans to you who have a very hard time and are in a fretful zone, they might have a TV at home. It doesn't change anything. TVs cost $100 to buy and they might have a TV and even a bad used car. It doesn't change their status. This is important because on a regular basis, you get these long articles and lists of how good the American, the American poor have it. So you have, you know, you read that 91% have uh, uh, color, you know, as if you can have a black and white TV, they have a color TV, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of these. They come on a regular basis, and what's interesting is there's often, there's rarely any commentary on what exactly is this telling me? Okay, so 100 million Americans who cannot finish the month have a blender. Now what? Um, the last one came in 2011. It was a big Heritage Foundation report that, again, counted all the air conditioning and the TVs that the poor have. And 
It was reported in all the media with very little commentary, except for the true you know, observers of the American scene. So Steve Colbert said, this report proves that poor people are just not living down to our expectations. If you still have the strength to brush the flies off your eyeballs, you're not really poor. <laughs> now, this is interesting because this is Colbert's vulgar way of saying exactly what the Heritage Foundation meant to say. Uh, John Stewart says, I never realized the poor had it so good in this country. No wonder the middle class is pouring into their ranks and droves. <laughs> now, why is this interesting? It's interesting because 270 years before this, Adam Smith took care of this. We know exactly what all this means. Adam Smith has several pass passages. This is one. He says that you, a linen shirt is not a necessity in life. It used to be the case that as a British worker, you were not expected to wear a linen shirt. Now that you are expected to wear a linen shirt, if you cannot afford it, you're poor. So you, sure, it used to be that nobody had linen shirts, but now that you're expected to wear it, if you don't have it, you're poor. And this is important, and I'm, gonna, I'm telling you all this because I'm going to abide by this and what I talk about. And some of it is going to be slightly mind-boggling, so take internet. Internet, five minutes ago, was sort of an unthinkable luxury. Now that it's standard, and the school where your kid goes assumes that your child can resort to the internet to download her homework, if you can't afford it, you're poor. The fact that it's amusing to somebody who used to think it's a luxury is not really relevant. So I'm going to go by the definition from now on, very much a la Adam Smith. Poor is somebody who cannot live the minimally acceptable life in a place and time in which they live. Of course it changes. To come and say to somebody, look, you have running water, what are you complaining about? It was an amazing dream 300 years ago, is not helpful. Okay, and by that definition, by not being able to live the minimally acceptable life in the time and place in which you live, poverty is rampant. And it's a profound psychological state in which massive million numbers of Americans find themselves. What about them? What do we know about them? So if you pack a very tight suitcase, you become very attentive and an expert on the size of things and how to, how to uh, think about trade-offs. And so there's many studies that you can look at this. This just shows that if you look at the high and low income, when you buy something, Low-income people are much more likely to report thinking about the trade-offs, what they're going to not have to be able to buy instead. So everybody in this room, if you were decided to buy a red Porsche, you'd think about what you cannot buy instead. But that's a Porsche. Everyday stuff, what's really interesting about that, every time you spend $10, it's $10 you'll never see again. From standard economics perspective, there is a trade-off to everything you do. Psychologically, many people in this room when you grab a cup of coffee, you have lunch with a friend, you buy a book, you do not stop to ask yourself, what will I not buy instead? The person who sells you the coffee or the book very often does ask themselves, if I have lunch with a friend, what will I not buy instead? So this trade-off thinking, the mind constantly thinking about me doing these trade-offs is much more common, it's rampant among those who have very tight small suitcases and those who have slack. Uh, this is a fun study we did in Boston. We stood outside the South Station in Boston, and when people came out, we asked them for their household income, we divided them into poor and rich, and asked them, when you get into a taxi in Boston, what does the meter read when you first get in? Now, it's a nice one because clearly the poor take less cabs than the rich, but they're much more likely to know the answer. So, you know, and, and that's the metaphor I want to leave you with. The rich enters the cab and has a luxury. They bought the luxury to look at how beautiful the Charles River is today. The poor are checking the meter. Uh, lots of work in marketing, it's not our work, but it's just out there, about things like if you stand outside the supermarket and ask people for the receipt and ask them how much did you pay for the pasta, for the sauce, for the crackers, the poor know the answer is much better than the rich. They attend and they know well. My favorite from that literature, which I didn't know before, is what's known as a quantity surcharge. Turns out they claim up to 20%, it seems high to me, but the claim is that up to 20% of items in your supermarket have the following quality. Half a pound of spinach costs $5, and a pound costs 12. Now, those of you who are still awake should say to me, well, you're confused, and the point is, no, I'm not confused, that's the trick. We assume that if you get a bigger package, you pay less per unit items, and because they know we assume it, they charge us extra for the bigger package. Why is this pretty? Because marketing research suggests that this thing cannot be found in poor neighborhoods. It just doesn't work, it doesn't sell. The poor check and say, ah, oh, I'll take two half pounds instead of a pound. 
Okay, so what we're seeing here again and again is that the poor are attending, working hard, computing, and doing a good job of doing the best they can with the very limited finances at their disposal. Uh, this is a little bit inside baseball. For those of you who are into this sort of thing, this is a classic Kahneman Tversky question, if you recall. Basically, you're told you're going to buy a calculator for $100, and as you go to pay, the person at the counter says to you, by the way, you can get the same thing for $50 less 45 minutes away. Would you go? Question number two, you're going to buy a computer for $1,000, and you find that 45 minutes away, you can get it for $50 less. Would you go? Sophisticates, comfortable people who are not budgeting very carefully, the regular subjects that, they, that we interview, this is replicated in the Princeton train station, report a much greater willingness to travel 45 minutes to save $50 if you're saving 50% than if you're saving five. Standard economics says you're kind of confused because it's 45 minutes, $50, what difference does it make what the item costs? You're gonna spend more this week anyway. When you do this with the poor, you don't get it. Now, I'm not trying to say the, economy, the, the poor are better economists, but I am saying that if you take errors of this kind that basically come from a fuzzy sense of a dollar, $50, what, you know, the poor know exactly. They know, am I in business for 45 minutes, $50 or not? In ways that the, the, the richer start being fuzzy about. So the poor are doing a very good job at, at these levels. They also just think about money a lot more of the time. This is an old, uh, cognitive trick many of you will recognize. This is a case where I give you a list of words, all of which are associated with the word man. So male, uncle, son, woman, beard, husband, there's no man here. And later when you ask people to, rec to identify words they saw, there's a significant tendency to think you saw man, although it was not there, compared to say the shoe. Okay, so because I give you a bunch of words that associate with it, it makes you think you saw man. What we did here is we replicated the classic finding and then I did another one with words that might relate to money. And what you see here is that the poor and the rich are equally likely to think they saw man, but the poor are much more likely to think they saw money in this list than the rich. Money is ever present, as it were. When I talk about phone and coin and bills and expenses, the poor think money, the rich don't. It's just very salient in the cognition and the everyday life of the poor. Uh, if you give people a vignette where they go to a doctor's office, and a doctor tells them there's a real serious medical problem, but it can be resolved. Sort of heavy news, but not disastrous. And then ask them to report what, they, what, they, what came to mind. The poor and the rich are equally likely to report emotion-related words. The poor are much more likely to think about the money involved as a doctor is speaking than the rich. So as you're sitting and the doctor is giving you this bad news, you're not completely listening to her because you're thinking about the money it might entail if you're poor, but not if you're rich. Okay, so in many ways, what we're finding here is that the poor are spending a lot more time computing, juggling, doing trade-offs, thinking about this resource they don't have enough of. Another question is when you get this very source-heavy cognitive demand, again, it doesn't have to be money, it could be hunger and thirst and other things, what happens? And the number one argument is gonna be when you don't have enough of something, there's a certain urgency to everything you're doing. That's where your mind focuses, it tunnels on the thing that's important. And other things, even if you know they're important, are completely left fuzzy in the periphery while you're worried about the thing that worries you most. Again, if you wanna do the exercise that I propose to do occasionally, think about being very time poor. There is a deadline tomorrow, nine in the morning, you have an essay to submit by nine in the morning. This is where you're going. You're gonna forget your mother's birthday, you're gonna forget the things on the stove. You're focused, you're tunneled on this deadline. That's kind of what happens when you're scarce. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of stories that, that we learned in writing the book. This is an amazing study. It's uh, completely standard uh, if you go to conferences on nutrition, but most psychologists have never seen it. So in 1943, when the Allies realized they were about to inherit a lot of very, very hungry, starving people in European camps, they also realized they didn't know how to feed them. Feeding the starving, and it's a little bit coming down from mountain climbing, is a very important element. And so they hired uh, Ansel Keys, who at the time was the leading nutritionist in the US, in Minnesota, to study how to feed the starving. Now, of course, to feed the starving, he had to starve people first. So he got a bunch of extremely impressive, conscientious objectors, young, talented, highly educated men who refused to fight the war, 
and because they were objecting to the good war, were very eager to volunteer, and he starved them. Not to death, but to massive discomfort. The stories, the physical, so Ansel Keys, a lot of the books describe the physical effects. We found a little bit of, on the mental stuff. The physical effects are very touching. So these guys cannot keep their heads above their heads long enough to wash their hair. They're so weak. They need cushions to sit down. There's no padding left, all that stuff. Psychologically, it's sort of tragicomic. These guys are very hungry. The last thing they want to do is, is to think about food, and they can't think about anything else. These are guys super talented, super educated, who are planning to open restaurants, memorizing recipes, comparing the, f the price of foods in different newspapers, just thinking food. At some point, the experimenters feel so bad that they, they decide to distract them with a movie. And the testimonials afterwards, that they showed us a movie, I couldn't care less about the love scenes, I wanted to see the meals. So that's all they're thinking about. And so in some sense, what's going on here is your mind is captured by the thing you don't have enough of, both, as it were, thinking fast and thinking slow, immediately and in the long term. It's the first thing you think of, it's silent in your head, and it's also what you choose to talk about. You're consumed by juggling the thing you don't have enough of. This is a very sweet study done by a number of researchers where they basically ask subjects to come not having had anything to drink for four hours. Everybody's thirsty. By random assignment, half get water, another half get pretzels. Not a good idea when you're thirsty. And then you have to do a lexical decision task, just identify the words. And what they find is that those who had pretzels identify thirst-related words significantly faster than those who had water, those who have been satiated, uh, relative to control <coughs> words. Okay, now these are three to 500 millisecond decisions. It's, you're literally walking around with your mind triggered to perceive the thing you don't have enough of, in this case, thirst. Uh, we did another one with, these are dieters, and so these are the, the experimental dieters and the controls are non-dieters. It's a classic word search, you have to find words on this grid. Notice that the odd number words are diet related, cake, donut, sweet, etc., and the even number words are controlled. In condition number two, we replace the diet related words, cake and donut, with neutrals, street, picture, etc. Now what we're gonna do is see how long it takes you to find the exact same words in both grids. How long it takes you to find tree and cloud as a function of whether the surrounding words are diet related or not. Don't worry about the details. Basically, what you get is that those who are not dieting don't show the effect. Dieters take significantly longer to find the word cloud when it follows a donut than when it follows a picture. So when you're dieting and you've seen a donut, it literally interferes with the next thing you're looking for. There's like a donut hovering in your head. Okay, and so you're prone to see things very quickly. They're salient in a cognitive system, but they interfere with the next thing. This is another very sweet study. This is a classic Stroop test, of those of you who know it. You basically take two groups who have been previously identified. One group has, these are grown-ups, have serious concerns about retirement issues, and the other group doesn't. And your only task here is to name the color in which the word appears. And what you find is that both groups identify blue equally quickly, but those who are worried about retirement say red much slower than those who are not. Again, you've seen this concern you have interfering with your function. And so this is some of the things we looked at, and uh, one more, uh, those who are not, I don't know, cognitive psychologists, psychologists in the room, let me just say one more thing, it's a nice study. The whole point here is that our cognitive capacity, our bandwidth to attend to several things is much more limited than we realize. So if, you've, if you're interested in recent studies, for example, on cell phone use in cars, it's sort of sobering so to speak, but basically, if you're driving and speaking on a cell phone, no hands held, forget the hands. You're talking on a cell phone in the car, your reaction time and your ability to detect the periphery as gauge in studies and simulators roughly equals being legally drunk. Okay, so, and this is something we don't have an introspective access to. I tell it to you and you and I will get in the car and talk on the phone again. We think we can beat it, but the fact is that our minds are very, very limited. Once you get distracted, you do less well elsewhere. This is a beautiful study that was done by sociologists. It's a school in Connecticut that by, by chance divided elementary school students into two classrooms. One classroom was in a quiet side of the school, the other was near the train tracks. So on an occasional basis throughout the day, the kids in the, in the train track side of the school would have a train go by their window. So there's noise. Distracting, sure, noise is distracting. How distracting is it? These guys discovered that in fifth grade, 
those in a noisy and a train side of the school were one year behind in academic performance in the fifth grade. It's a massive effect. They then install soundproofing, the effect goes away, they catch up, etc. Now, what the, the thought I want to leave you with is imagine yourself now in a perfectly quiet room, no disturbances, you're trying to do a serious test, and worries about rent or food for your kids go through your head. Call these internal trains. The argument that these internal trains can have an impact very much of the ones outside the window. And so uh, I'll tell you a couple of studies. This is a study we did in a mall in New Jersey. We go to people on a Saturday morning, they agree to participate, they sit in front of a computer, and we'll give them scenarios that are relevant to sort of everyday financial difficulties. So your car breaks down, it's gonna cost you X dollars to fix. These scenarios each come in two versions, manageable and challenging. The manageable, the car is gonna cost you $100 to fix, which we know for most people in the small is perfectly manageable. The challenging, the car is gonna cost you $1,500 to fix, which we know for many people in the small is a giant challenge. You see these scenarios, you think about how you're gonna take care of them, and then you're gonna say, how are you gonna manage this issue? While you're thinking, just to make things more interesting, we'll give you, let you play some games, which many people in this room will recognize as classic cognitive tests. This is basically a divided attention test. You have to respond as quickly as you can. Same side if you see a heart, opposite side if you see a flower, it's sort of divided attention, it's confusing. And this is the Raven's matrices. Everybody who is in this room has done these before several times. You, know, you have to look for the shape that, fest, that best fits in the missing space. Many, many tests have claimed that Raven, this test is the closest we've come, it's not perfect, but it's the closest we've come to a test that manages to gauge your ability to do fluid intelligence, to think in real time, independent of whether you are a noble physicist or a farmer. It's not perfect, but it's the best we've got. It's the fluid intelligence component of almost all IQ tests. So they're thinking about these scenarios, how they're gonna take care of them, and they do these tests. And now we're gonna do, we'll look at how well they did when they looked at these scenarios as a function of whether they're high and low in income. We divide our participants into low and high income. So here's what you get. If you look at the cognitive control, the divided attention test, you know, how well you drive, as it were, the rich do just as well whether they're worried about the 150 or the $1,500 car. No difference. They perform just as well. Their poor friends in the mall, when they're worried about the $150 car, look just like the rich. But when they're worried about the $1,500 car, they drive significantly less well. There's less mind now left for doing the stupid game we just gave them. Uh, if you look at the IQ tests, the rich don't care which one they're doing. The poor, when they're worried about the manageable car, are statistically equal to the rich. When they're worried about the challenging $1,500 car, they lose a lot of IQ points. Now this is a Cohen's D of 0.9. If you make certain assumptions about the normal distribution of the IQ score, this is about a 13-point IQ effect. In, in, the, in the school where my kids go, 13 points on a qualitative scale is enough to take you from average to borderline gifted or from average to borderline deficient. It's a big effect. We know from other studies people have done, if I kept you up all night, you know, with Springsteen blasting in the background, <laughs> you'd be here today about nine IQ points less capable. Now think of yourself here taking a test, not having slept a minute all night, these guys, who a minute ago were just as good as their rich friends, are now feeling worse in terms of their ability to focus. It's a big effect. Um, I'm not going to the details. The study is as clean as we could do it, but notice there's a problem because it's the rich and the poor in America. They're not the same. They have different heart rates, different educational levels. It's all controlled, but still, the dream was can we do this within subject? It's not easy to do this within subject in the US to get people rich and poor, but in other places it's easier. So we replicated this with sugarcane farmers in India. Sugarcane happens to be a very good place to go because you harvest only once a year. So these are people whose bulk of their income, at least 65% of their income comes in one shot in one day. And basically what we do is we, we gauge, we give these farmers tests very similar to the ones you saw on handheld devices one month before or a month after harvest. So when they're in, in context of plenty or in context of scarcity. And basically what you get, if you look at reaction times and errors, with about nine to 10 IQ points. Now it's the same dude, same health, same education. There are nine to 10 IQ points less capable during scarcity than during plenty. Uh, for a humorous note, right after we did this, uh, the New York Lottery of all places, this, but if you don't quite realize it right away, this is an institution that abuses the poor, came out with an, with an announcement, what will you think about when you don't have to think about money? 
if tomatoes are a fruit, wouldn't ketchup technically be a smoothie? Why do people say tuna fish but not chicken bird? Funny, the word bed actually looks like a bed. There's a whole giant array of these. What will people think about if they don't have to think about money? <laughs> so there you go. Okay, so um, what are we saying so far? We're saying that scarcity is demanding of attention, both intentionally and automatically. It focuses you on immediate problems at the expense of other things. And this is important for longer debate that's sort of in the background. It's not about the poor, it's about people who find themselves in context of being poor. And there's a big difference. The same people who a moment ago were just as capable are less good when you make them poor, or at least preoccupy about things that have to do with poverty. This is probably the most satisfying study I've ever run in my life. This is uh, Princeton undergraduates. Um, we can't make them poor in money so easily, but it's easy to make them poor in time. So they come to play a game. Uh, it's a uh, family feud, they all love it, they want to shine, they want to do well, it's very important for them to get paid according to how well they do, the whole thing, it's high incentives. By random assignment, we'll make them either poor or rich in time. The rich have 50 seconds per round, which is pretty comfortable. The poor have 15 seconds, which is very rushed. Crossed with that, half the poor and half the rich, you're in a condition where you cannot borrow, so every time a round ends, you move to the next one. The others are in a condition where you can borrow if you run out of time and you want a couple extra seconds, feel free to take them at predatory lending rates, 100% interest. If you take an extra second, it costs you two seconds from the bucket of time that you have to begin with, because you're paying high interest. Um, quickly, I'm gonna, these are data, so rounds completed and points earned are two measures roughly of the same thing. So basically you end up with fewer rounds before you run out of money and you leave with less money. So these are two similar measures. This is showing you how well they do in the conditions where they cannot borrow. What you find where you cannot borrow is that the rich do better than the poor. Not surprisingly, they have more time. Now, if I had more time, I would convince you that actually, since they have so much more time, they should be doing a lot better than they're doing. And we have data on this. The poor, those who have 15 seconds, are totally focused the way you are when you have a deadline tomorrow morning. Those have a lot of time, it's like the guys in the cab. They're sitting back, schmoozing, wasting time, doing lot, much less well. But that's apropos. Back to this, here's what happens when you cannot borrow. Now what happens if I let you borrow? I say to you here, there's, you, can ex, you can take extra seconds for high cost. The rich say, mm, I don't need it so much, this is a bad deal, not interested. The poor, and by the poor I mean the same Princeton students who now are stressed for time, take my payday loan. They grab this extra time at very high cost and leave the experiment with significantly less money. So why is this so satisfying to me? Because remember I told you that pay their loans, the big puzzle is, are people as educated, is it deviant values, is it self-control? What we're seeing here is that Princeton students who nobody would take as the ultimate, is the perfect candidate group for lacking self-control or being myopic. They are in Princeton after all, they must have done something right. Basically, a minute ago, when they had enough time, looked very sophisticated, once they're experiencing scarcity, they resort to pay their loans. I also mentioned to you that uh, poor parents tend to be uh, less attentive to their children. This, is, this just says air traffic control. So uh, there is a beautiful study with sociologists of air traffic controllers. It's a nice topic because what happens in air traffic control, as opposed to many other jobs, you have good and bad days, more or less randomly distributed depending on weather and traffic. So what they do is they sit in these guys' living rooms for weeks and gauge how they are at home after a day's work, whether there's good or bad days, so basically they find that these guys are less attentive spouses and less pleasant parents on good days and bad, on bad days and good days. Okay, and again, the point is that it's, it's the scarcity that makes you a bad parent, nothing to do with being inherently poor. And so this, is, this has become an important issue, of course, because the ultimate debate, to be very, very blunt about it, is you know, are the poor poor because they're less capable, or are less capable because they're poor? And this data seems pretty clear that people were a minute ago were just as capable once poverty raises its ugly head, perform at a lower level. Now, if this is true, this, there are some interesting policy implications here. First of all, the implication is when you have clients who come who, who have less money, they often also have less bandwidth. They're just juggling this issue and have less mind for other things. And that has enormous implications for what kind of forms you should demand of them, how rigid you should be with your timing of them, whether you should penalize them for being late, all the kinds of things that many well-intentioned organizations are not always getting correct. 
Um, there's, I'm not going to get a lot of details, we can talk more about this later, but there's many things you can do that basically manage to ease my packing, make my life a little easier. It's remarkable how many things happen in everyday life that make our lives, those are not terribly poor, easier. Everything from automatic deposits and automatic payments and lawyers that help you and, you know, depending on who you are, gardeners and nannies and all kinds of other things. Those who need it the most often have it the least. And so, you know, when I signed the mortgage for my house, I signed a 150-page document of which I understood nothing. Didn't even try. But I had the luxury to assume that whoever is doing this for me will not give me a ballooning mortgage. Those who don't have that luxury and need it more end up with something that destroys their housing. So there's something, if you take into account the importance of having help juggling your everyday life, it's remarkable how those who need it the most get the least of it, and when they get it, it's not always reliable and trustworthy. And you can design programs very badly. I mean, many examples of this. Here is one that's interesting. Um, Look at TANF. So if you remember, uh, this has come now into discussion a lot because there, the, the implications are coming up. But when President Clinton introduced his you know, welfare new, not as we know it, a whole new welfare system, if you remember, he introduced a five-year limit to welfare receipts for American citizens. Now, it's a good example because clearly this is not the intention. But imagine if, imagine if I say to you, this was a lovely afternoon, please send me one paragraph about your thoughts of this in five years. What do you do? Four years, 11 months, three weeks, nada. And then you say, ah, oh, yeah, this jerk wanted a paragraph, I'll send something. When you take the American poor and tell them there's a five-year limit, they have a problem Friday. They have a problem rent at the end of the month. You have introduced a threat that's totally outside their tunnel. They're focusing on problems today, tomorrow, next week, and you left a threat that's completely penalizing but totally fails to incentivize them right now. And what happened is that many people woke up and say, whoa, I'm running out of welfare in a few months. If you took seriously this cognition we're talking about, you need something else. You either need 10 half-year limits or you need to send me very serious reminders. You have to do something because what you've done here is assume I'll think about it, but of course I don't until it's the last minute. Why? Because I have seriously very important problems to deal with right now. Uh, and so there's a lot of these things we can talk about how if you take seriously the cognitive juggling and the bandwidth available to people, how you design policies, one, not to hurt them, and two, to facilitate their everyday juggling. It also has very interesting implications for influence. Those who are uh, interested in work on influence, if you remember, to make it very simple, when I try to influence you, there's roughly two ways I can go. I can get to your central processor, I can give you an argument where I want you to weigh the pros and the cons and make the deductions and think about what I'm saying. That sort of full listening and understanding. Or I can have you very busy and I'll just put a poster of Coca-Cola on the wall, you're not even thinking about it, and you leave with the urge to have a Coke. Okay, so this is kind of central processing and peripheral. Ask yourself, what poster do I put on the wall to give you the urge to save for retirement? If you look at ads to save for retirement, they look like this. They need your full attention. You have to stop doing everything you're doing and get a little mini PhD in saving for retirement before you know what to do. Okay, can't do it peripherally. Now imagine if instead I want to sell you cigarettes. I don't want your central processor, because you have a thousand arguments why it's not good to do. I want you to be super busy, and while you're very busy doing other things, I'm going to flash pictures of beautiful people, Italian villas, you know, the US, maybe a few guns could be a good thing, and next thing you know, you have the urge to smoke. And this is important because what it suggests is if you take people who are cognitively loaded with very little bandwidth, some messaging will get through and others will not in a pretty systematic and consistent fashion that is not inconsequential. Peripheral messaging ends up being, you know, there's a reason why when you open Vanity Fair, the first 40 pages are just ads for which they paid millions. There's a reason it works. We think it's comical, but it works. I'll give you just one example because it's one of my favorite studies. This is a study within South Africa it's not a bank, it's a money lender. This is predatory lending world. It's a money lender for reasons that I won't get into that are actually quite comical. They allowed us to do the following. Um, they wanted to know what the right interest to charge is. We told them it's an empirical question. They said, okay, go ahead. So what we do is we send people this letter inviting them to apply for a loan. Everybody who receives this letter has taken a loan from this money lender before. 
at least once, an average of five times, so they know this money lender pretty well. We randomize the interest rate that's offered on this loan from three to 12 percentage points monthly at increments of a quarter of a percent. So you might get three and a quarter, you might get five and a half, anywhere between three and 12% monthly. And if you're worried about the ethics of it, the ongoing rate in this predatory mon uh, market is higher than 12. So all of them in some sense are getting a gift, but some are getting a much bigger gift than others. Along with randomizing the interest rate, we randomize a number of behavioral features. I won't get into all of them. But here you see a table of four examples of loans you can take. People hate complicated tables. Some get these complicated tables, and others, by random assignment, get just one example. Just less information, that's all, but kind of more friendly. Uh, notice here on the bottom left, you have a nice dude smiling. Some people get this dude, others get a dudette, and others get no picture at all. Now, this is all crossed. It's 60,000 actual households, and it's all crossed. So now we can ask, when I change the picture, well, I can ask, does interest rate make a difference? And when I change a picture, what does it do to take up relative to interest rate? Is it the same as lowering it to, raising one? So we can do all these questions. So for the economists in the room, interest rate makes a difference. As you raise interest, take up goes down, as the economics would predict. But when you take this complicated table and simply make it easier, just give people less information, take up goes up the equivalent of lowering interest 2.3 percentage points monthly. When you take the nice dude here and put a debt instead, take up of this loan, this is about two months worth of income, all the, all the data is for real, actual money taken. When you change this dude to a debt, take up of a loan goes up, the equivalent of lowering interest four percentage points monthly. This is a massive effect for a picture and a letter that you're about to put in the garbage. And this is peripheral messaging. This is why Vanity Fair has all these ads. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because if we let the low ball players of the world, those who are out there to give people balloon mortgages, play these games, and we in government say we have too much respect for people to do it, guess who will win the battles? And this is a real problem. We have so much respect for people, which means ignoring how we process information and pretending we're different creatures, that we hurt them. Americans have an enormous impulse to avoid regulation and government interference which leaves people with pay their loans, jungles out there, and people will give them mortgages and ballooning mortgages with teddy bears and cute pictures, and the good guys, presumably, respect them too much to do anything. And this is a real problem we have in policy. Um, we talk in the book a little bit about thinking about life as a cockpit. There's a lot to do, it's complicated, I'm busy. You need to help design a cockpit that helps me navigate better. Notice, it doesn't say I'm not taking responsibility for my actions. I still need to do the right things. I still need to fly the plane, but you need to help me. In the world of aviation, by the way, there is unbelievable examples of badly designed cockpits and dead pilots as a result. And you need to figure out, if I have to push the stick rather than pull it to lift off, I'm gonna make mistakes. And the same thing goes for banking and other areas where we can design products that help people or don't. Here's a cute fact. Uh, checking accounts in the US deposit money in your account five days a week and withdraw it from your account seven. Now that's a really cute exotic fact for all of us who have enough money in the bank. Those who don't, those who have $17 and trying to juggle the balance, for them this is a, an everlasting, eternal, impossible puzzle. Because if I give you a check for $40 on Wednesday and deposit a check on Wednesday, one goes out, one fails to go in, and I get hit with a big penalty. In fact, in checking in the US today, most sophisticates, most of those who can afford it, do not pay for their checking accounts. It comes for free. It's all subsidized by penalties on the poor. Okay, so, and I can go on and on, but there is something wrong about this issue, and the question is, how do you design contexts that are more helpful? Uh, this is an example of a badly designed context, but it makes an important point. This is a picture of the tension between intention and action. These are people who plan to spend 45 minutes on the Stairmaster. They see the escalator, they're on it. And it stands for something important because a lot of everyday life, you have people who have the right intention, they want to save for retirement, and now the question is, are you making it easy for them or difficult for them to end up with savings for retirement? Uh, 
FAFSA is the single most generous benefit program the US government gives to its citizens. It's a lot of money to go to college. I assume some people in this room have FAFSA. Um, take up is low. It's about a third of eligibles. This is, you know, some people are offered, you know, $20,000 to go to college, which is, you know, alters their lifetime expected earnings and everything else. A third the take up. This is what the form looks like. Uh, needless to say, after many incomprehensible passages, it somewhere reminds you of doing this under the penalty of perjury and all the other stuff. Uh, take up is not high. Now, think about this. What do we do? So they did one study where they go to people and say, I've checked, so the, the purple is current take up and matriculation. I go to you and I say, I know everything about you. I checked your parents' income, your household earnings. You're eligible for FAFSA. Here is the form. Result, green. Nothing happens. Version number three. I know everything about you. I've checked your family income. You're eligible for FAFSA. Here is the form. Let's sit down for an hour together and fill it out. Matriculation goes up 25%. This is somebody at you know, minimum wage spending an hour with you filling out a form much cheaper than enormous educational campaigns we've tried, where all you're doing is increasing people's wanting to do it, but still leaving them with the obstacle of having to do it. Uh, lots of data on savings in, wor in, in the workforce. This is Labson and his colleagues have done a lot of these, uh, of these studies at Harvard. Basically, these are people who come to work at a company, and by random assignment, some of them are defaulted into 3% savings into retirement with the option to call a number and increase or decrease it. The others are defaulted into 6% saving for retirement with the option with a single phone call. Your transaction cost is a phone call to, emit, to diminish or increase it. This is now four years later. These are people who are working in the same office, playing schmoozing together, bowling, meeting in the water fountain. Four years later, those who have been defaulted into higher savings are going to retire significantly richer than those who have been defaulted into lower savings, where all you have to do to change probably the most important decision of your life is a phone call. Okay. Now, again, why is this important? Because many of us work for places that do the right thing, and others work for places where they don't do the right thing and leave it to them to take care of, and they don't. Uh, my favorite, this is a glow cap. This is a $15, little, $15 little gadget that complains if you don't open it in time to take your medication. Now, when I say complains, actually, it's quite remarkable. It lights up, it squeaks, it sends you an email and calls you on your cell phone saying, open me. <laughs> And the argument is, why is this important? Because if you're HIV positive, taking your medication 70% of the time is not 70% good. These are people who have the intention to do it, and it's in their pocket, but you know, life interferes. And the argument is too early to gauge, but the argument is this could have life expectancy effects of many years on those whose lives inter interfere with their, with their better wishes. Uh, some of you may know, President Obama last year in September issued an executive order directing all government agencies to at least consider behavioral issues when they issue uh, all kinds of, of, of programs and, and regulations. So that's been sort of a victory for psychology. Um, a couple of last comments. Are we okay with Tom? Yeah. Um, why would you do any of this? The, the reason you want to do all this is because if you do, this is a 100-year-old quote, uh, almost, from an economist, the president of the American Economic Association, and basically what it says is, look, if you're going to do policy of any sort, not just policy, if you're going to be a husband, a, a, a wife, a teacher, a cab driver, you depend on human psychology. Now, either you understand human psychology, or you make up what you think is human psychology, or you may get it very wrong. And a lot of, a lot of what we're talking here really boils down to that. Our intuition, our introspective access to the correct psychology is highly flawed. It's true it's happening in our heads, we just don't happen to be able to look at it correctly. And so if you don't look at the findings and understand what people do, you kind of make up assumptions about what people do and you can get it very wrong. Now I have a whole collection of, of bad psychology. I won't, I won't take you through all of them. I'll give you a couple of very quick ones. Here's a really pretty one. It's not empirical, it's just theoretical. Many of you have encountered Pareto optimality before. It's a beautiful idea. What Pareto said is, look, if there is, if there is a place, another condition in the world where some of us are better off, and nobody is less good off, then that's a better place to be. Now, it's sort of logically unassailable, it's beautiful. Turns out, it's not probably not true in dollars, or in yens, or in marks. What do I mean by that? There's good reason to think that if I took 10 wonderful people on that side of the room and gave them a 100% raise, and gave all of you no raise or 1% raise, well-being in this room may have gone down. Everybody is better off, 
in dollars. But well-being may have gone down because we have a lot of data now suggesting that how you feel is not just a function of how many dollars you make, but how you do relative to others who you consider, for example, equally meritorious. So this says, yes, it's true that if everybody's better off, it's better off. But it may not be true in simply giving people more pay. There's a real tension between GDP and inequality, if you will. If you increase GDP, being completely ignorant of the inequality that's going on, oblivious to it, you might actually lower well-being. This is an argument that's been made by many people now. It's at least an open question. And it's a subtle one that depends entirely on the psychology of well-being. How happy am I with a 5% raise when my colleague next to me got 100? Happier or less happy? And what does that tell us about how to compute national well-being? I'm going to skip this. Here's another one that I like a lot. This is uh, emergency rooms in Ontario. Ontario has a problem. The homeless show up in the emergency room and hang out a lot. They come with you know, real but not life-threatening ailments. And there's a lot of them in the emergency room. What do you do? Um, clearly, and they're dissatisfied. Clearly, the standard interpretation has always been it's cold in Ontario. The emergency room is a place where you can get a little warmth and maybe a cup of tea. We've got to stop this or the homeless will come in, in, in nonstop. A couple of physicians, Don Riddlemar and his colleagues, had a suspicion and ran a study. What they did is, when the homeless came in, they were, they were randomly assigned to the standard treatment, as always, or to a compassionate treatment, where they got treated extremely well with an intern who kind of inquired how they're doing, what they can do for them, how can they do better, etc. What they discovered is that those who were treated compassionately were significantly less likely to return to this or any other hospital in the province. It turns out that the homeless came because they had something that hurt them. If they felt you didn't take them seriously, they came again to this or another hospital. If they felt you did all you could for them, they had no interest in coming back to the emergency room. And so until you discovered this, the intuitive psychology got it all wrong. You kept not taking care of them, which made them come back again and again. Okay, that's bad psychology. Now, this bad psychology occupies a lot of how we think, particularly about the poor. Uh, I was mentioning to some people, this was mentioned, the, the Gates Foundation is trying to decide how to do uh, funding of domestic poverty. And we've been touring uh, everywhere, everywhere from Ferguson to Delta and other places. In my view, there's one thing that comes up again and again. If you look at the US treatment of the poor, we're a country of good, well-intentioned people with draconian, unforgiving, vicious laws toward the poor and the disenfranchised. And the question is, why is this going on? If you read Brian Stevenson's book about capital punishment and life without parole in the South now, in recent years, it is simply stunning. Uh, if you read uh, Matt Desmond's book on evictions and the, and the rental market, it is stunning. And I think a lot of it comes from not understanding. It's a little bit the homeless in the Ontario emergency room. You see the poor doing bad things and they say they're bad people. You see mothers looking irresponsible, you're saying they're irresponsible. Instead of understanding the context that brings this behavior in people who otherwise would look wonderful, instead of improving their context and giving them a chance, you penalize them in vicious ways. And I think there's something really deep to think about that as we progress, because there are clear cases of total misinterpretation. Let me give you a totally trivial example. There's a lot of critique about the poor who spend their money on frivolities. So you have a single mother who comes home, you know, she lives in the Bronx, she ends the month, the week, she has $70 in her pocket. What does she do with the $70? You know, she has big debts she hasn't taken care of. She buys her kid, you know, fancy sneakers. And we all look at her and say, well, well, that is ridiculous. If you look a little bit more carefully, this is a woman who's unbanked. She comes home to the house in the Bronx. It's a question of three minutes before her mother, her boyfriend, her sister, her brother, somebody genuinely badly needs the money. We know from tons of, tons of data, they give each other money much more than we ever will. This woman, as she comes home to the Bronx on a Friday with $70, has two options. Go home with 70 and lose it in three minutes, or save it by spending it on a gift for my kid to whom I've said no for a month. The anger with which you see the critique of her spending is stunning once you understand a little bit more the context in which she lives. And there is data that if you take people who are angry and misunderstanding and portray it this way, there's some hope. 
that the better side that all of the Americans carry with them, or at least to a large extent, I don't mean to sound too naive, but there is a better side to many of us, would alter these incredibly vicious policies that are out there. And you know, in some sense, we have an obligation. When FDR came up with his four freedoms, those were adopted, this was 50 years ago, they were adopted by the, by the International Bill of Human Rights in the UN. We are in some sense obligated, if we have ways to ameliorate the conditions and create freedom from want and fear, we should do it. And there's plenty of data coming from psychologists and behavioral scientists suggesting ways in which we can make things significantly better. That's my message today, thank you. Thanks. The first one is always the hardest. Okay. I've done nothing with kids. Uh, you know, Sean Coffin, there's a couple of groups who do a lot of work on kids in poverty. Uh, very po powerful findings. In a sense, you know, there's a difference. The two kinds of effects you can look on the poor. There's a static and there's a dynamic. There is stuff that happens to you as you grow up poor. That, you know, we can discuss, you know, the plasticity of being able to recover from it or not, but it's very powerful. The stuff we do, if you notice, whatever happens, I'm not touching that. I'm going to people in five minutes, giving them two tasks where poverty is more or less impinging on their thinking. So in a sense, it's almost a phenomenal. Whatever happened to those kids when they grew up in the mall, I'm getting them mad to exhibit a higher or lower capacity being the same person. And the fact that they have suffered growing up poor is pretty, not my data, but it's cl pretty clearly there. That's coming from Shondoff and others who start from super young kids and all throughout uh, childhood. Everything from brain development to, of course, education and all the rest. So there's a big disadvantage. Some of it you can recover from, probably not completely, but I don't know if anybody knows that part. You know, uh, what you find in poverty in general, we discuss this in the book a little bit, is that it's one place where everything goes wrong. It's dangerous neighborhoods, noisy neighborhoods, very little, very few, you know, when we have a problem, we ask our colleagues, our friends, very little access to people who are socially connected to help you. Everything, nutrition, development, sleep. Yes. Uh, I picked up on maybe a little bit of contradiction or something I'm not sure about. You said that the poor are they're keeping track and they're making they're making good decisions about how to, how to fill the small suitcase. At the same time, they seem more vulnerable to making bad decisions, like the mother who spends fifty dollars on her toy for her kids. So, is there a, what is the trigger for that? Is it the, Something else comes along that, that really overloads the cognitive system, or is it just the poverty gets worse and suddenly they can't think anymore and they, they give in to the. How would you talk about that? I, I would talk about it as an apparent contradiction that's not a contradiction. In other words, you know, when, when, when I'm focused very hard on writing a paper for the next day, I forget my mother's birthday. Now, it's not that I did something wrong or something good. I, de I devoted all my resources to one place and made a mistake. Now, I think what you're touching on, and I, and I agree with you. And it's interesting is that while I'm focusing on my finances, I make mistakes not only in what I eat, but also in my finances. In other words, when I'm juggling with insufficient resources, I also forget the car and pay a parking ticket, which is exactly the money I was working on saving right now. So it is right that when they're juggling, focusing very, by the way, the example about the mother and the 5,000 the kid was an example of no mistake. So for me, that was no mistake there. It's just misunderstanding of what you're doing. But more generally, the picture here is that as you're focusing on managing very, very complicated situations right now, you neglect the periphery, some of which is extremely relevant to what you're solving right now. That's exactly right. So, you know, when you are working very hard in managing food, money for food and forget to pay the rent, you look like you're financially inattentive as well. But it's not in conviction, it's kind of what happens when all your resources are focused and the rest are neglected. One of the things that you find about neglect in general in studies about neglect is you know, almost by definition, when I neglect things, I don't do them in order of importance. I just don't notice. It's not that I forgot my mother's birthday because it's not important to me. It's just I wasn't thinking about these things. And some of the things I forget might be more important than the things I was doing right now. Yeah? How does that 
does the psychology of scarcity apply to the fact that our public schools are largely driven, or the funding for public schools are largely driven by property taxes? <laughs> I mean, these are two very separate issues. Um, I mean, the psychology of scarcity is psychology of scarcity. Uh, funding in public schools, uh, I, this is not a political talk. I, I think um, issues of redistribution and you know sharing are problematic in the U.S. I, I think part. Of, I this is my story about this kind of narrative. If we change the narrative a bit, um, there is data, not mine, that if, if you ask, for example, people, you have a hundred points. Divide them between skill and chance, between responsibility and luck. For somebody who's poor, somebody who's in prison. What you find is that Americans give a lot more to responsibility than to chance. In Scandinavia, when you see a prisoner or come out of jail, there before the grace of God, Goliath or my son. In America, they did it. And the difference is enormous in terms of how you fund jails, how the jails look, what re-entry programs look like, what the schools for the poor look like. All of it is predicted by the fact that somehow that's not me, that's them, in ways that is exactly what I'm addressing here. I, I wish we could re adjust a bit to realize that those who look that way will be exactly how you looked if you're in the context in which they live. Now, I'm not saying I'm explaining property tax in schools. Uh, scarcity is not going to explain a lot of problems we have. But there is some connection. The lack of empathy among people are super empathetic. You know, Americans all get up and send money to a girl who falls in a well. But when that girl goes to school across the street, they're much less smooth, and that's an issue that's not all about scarcity, but it's not unrelated. Yes? I wonder if it, if, if, do you think that it's a difference in the context of poverty or the nature of poverty now versus in the past? Because it seems to me that, um, you know, if you talk to people uh, who were children during the Depression, right, and they, you know, they have their they're hoarding thread in a drawer and they keep all the rubber bands from their newspapers and they talk about the experience of poverty made them, has made them much more cautious, much more careful. It is not about, you know, they, they wouldn't say, oh yeah, when I was little my mom slurred on some candy for us. That, that would not have happened, right? That they would have said, no, we just went without. And we all, you know, kept that, I, I think, that's how they would treat themselves. So is it a difference about the context of a poor, a poor person now as compared to, say, during the 1940s or 30s? Uh, I mean, you're touching on two issues that I would have kept separate. So the fact that the kid does not see the mother as acting irresponsibly, I think, will be true today, too. Right. So I think that's a separate issue a little bit. Your description of people who survived the Depression, th there is a really interesting issue there that I don't really answer to. I think nobody does. Here is a question. You take people who, who grew up in poverty. Half of them, as you describe, are super conscientious with bread in their pockets and, and, and severely nuanced by the experience. The other half are nouveau riche wearing fancy suits and driving fancy cars. What made this half be this way and the other half that way? I don't think we know. And, and that's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, I grew up in Israel as a kid. I remember in fourth grade we'd have people, you know, substitute teachers come in with numbers from the camp. Half of them would be manic depressed, the other half would be clowns. And I remember in fourth grade thinking, why, why is this one so happy, this one so sad? They, they graduated from the same horror. And I think nobody knows the answer to that. Uh, but it is true that if you they take people who grew up in, in poverty, you get the two kinds. You get those who say, look, not only do they say, I'm out of it, they say, look, I made it, what do you, why, why can't they? And the other half were very different. Now, it's possible, of course, that they had very different experiences which we cannot differentiate from where we are. I don't know if they had the same experience or not. But but we don't, I don't think we know. And maybe some people in clinical will have a better insight, and I'd love to hear it, but I don't know how to explain it. Yeah? Yeah, I guess that relates to my question. I was wondering if you show the scarcity effects in many different contexts, but I'm wondering about maybe you both have thought about interventions that would reduce or eliminate the magnitude of uh, Yeah, so. People are, tr are looking at, there's a couple of experiments that have started now where they literally are going to give uh, the poor in Oakland $2,000 more every month and see what they do. There is a whole movement internationally about just give money to the poor, where instead of 
you know, you're giving money to X, we literally, we literally with GPS find a home in Nigeria and send them $800, no, word, no questions asked. The findings is very limited, but the findings on this little bit, which are, which are very consistent with findings domestically by Kathy Eden and others, is that when you give the poor money, contrary to the standard image of the gold loan, drink it and gamble it away, they use it very carefully and very well. These people are, you know, fixed leaky roofs, they pay for the kids' schools. You know, Kathy even estimates that 10% may, may, may go in the, in the category they consider wasteful. Uh, but mostly it's used well. The, the, these experiments are very complicated to do because if I take some people and open and give them 2,000, but I don't give it to everybody, then of course all your friends are going to need that money and you're going to share it. Instead of 2,000, you have 200, and now I have to gauge how well you can do 200. So these are tricky situations. But people have tried. Beyond money, of course, there's many other things you can do. So um, if, you, if you take the poor who is juggling and their mental capacity is devoted to managing this complicated resource, anything you do, what we call, you give them a cognitive gift, a cognitive you know, benefit, uh, subsidy. Give me reliable transportation in many places in the US, you've made my life significantly better when I'm poor, because I always have to take a bus two hours early because I can't risk being late to work, they'll fire me. Big issue for juggling. Here's an example that I think is really deep. McDonald's, when they hire people in the US, given their working hours, 72 hours in advance, 42 hours in advance, they take, say to you Friday, you're working 7 to 11. If you're a mother with a kid, you're in constant, permanent, unending child care management mode. What McDonald's doesn't understand, I think, is if they give you a two-week schedule, which I think they can do, they will get a worker who sleeps better, who makes less mistakes, and who's happier. So forget being nice, just self-serving. I think they don't appreciate what they're doing when they get people who are juggling and are not managing as opposed to people whose lives are simply calmer. So I think these kinds of things. Now, we actually try to do Starbucks at some point introduced this, and we immediately wrote to them saying, can we evaluate this one? You know, it's going to serve you well. Never heard back. But, but this is the kind of thing that if you did to evaluate public transportation, childcare, anything reliable, where I, can ha I have to manage less and plan less, the prediction is, I'll just do better and make less mistakes. But it's most of it the level of predictions. I don't know of any big studies. There's this one in, in Oakland that's they're, they're about to start a two-year major financial uh, subsidy experiment. Yeah. So I'm sort of curious of when you take these findings and try to uh, create a broader policy-based level, and sort of like with this algorithm of like very expensive to be poor, that I think people who have never been poor don't quite understand, and that's something that's sort of like valid in this. And how do you communicate this to people who have never been poor that are in charge of the large scale policy decisions? It's a deep, so for example, look, let's not think presidents. I mean, I, I think if mayors got it, in fact, there's some, some reason to think that you can get a lot more done through mayors and local government than big government. Also, they're, they're longer, they have more contacts, they have less obstacles. And so how do you get them to understand it? Now, you know, it's a very, it's a beautiful question. I don't know the answer to it. Part of it is a scenario change. But here's an example I was telling some people over lunch today. I was at a, a poverty exercise that the Fed ran in, 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 in Kansas. There's groups that do poverty simulations. You hire them. They come to a room like this. They assign you into groups. You're my brother, and you're my mother, and we manage. And as we go through this exercise, things happen. They come and hand you cards. You've been fired. You have a, you're sick, a doctor's visit. All kinds of things happen. You run around trying to manage your life. And after three or four hours of this, there was, a, there was a debriefing. And we sat around debriefing, and one very, very impressive, sophisticated banker sat there with tears in her eyes and said, I never thought I'd leave my kid home alone, her kid being another fancy banker, kid alone and leave and go to get some check cashed. She was blown away. I and mean, she had an experience that I'm pretty sure she'll never forget that she hadn't realized. Now, can we run all the mayors of America in a poverty simulation? <laughs> I don't know, but it's a start. Uh, I think, you know, look, your, your question is deep. Uh, these policymakers don't understand what it's like to be a soldier. 
They don't understand what it's like to be a policeman. There are many things they don't understand. We try to teach them, we try to explain to them what the issues are, what are the fears, what are the hopes. It's a big challenge. And, and it is true that if you look at behavioral science, there's many reasons to expect that we will profoundly not understand poverty. If you just think of the fact that we attribute things to people as opposed to the context, they don't look so good. They don't smell so good. They're not so nice. They're underslept. They're impatient. They're hurt. It's a challenge. That's right. Yes. So you started off and rightfully so, about how we treat the poor. And I think one of the worst things in America to be is poor. And so I imagine a lot of people spend a lot of energy and effort and cognitive effort avoiding the stigma of being poor, either convincing themselves or others. And I imagine even more than just, so to what degree does this compete, I guess, or be an explanation for the lack of cognitive resources? Because instead of, just more than just making ends meet, it is preserving the self-image. Think of Joe the plumber. Uh, I, I wish I'd mentioned this earlier, and thank you, you're absolutely right. So I don't think that's a competition. I mean, I think what we've done manipulating the cognitive of low income people, or the financial instruments, for example, who kept stigma unmoved in some sense. But you're totally right that managing stigma is another one of the many juggling things they have to do. Um, a lot of people who grew up poor, I proposed a story earlier, will tell you how their parents were out of the way not to let them know it which is a big problem. One of the reasons they can pay their loan is the kid has a school trip. You have to decide telling them we're poor, you can't go, they can pay their loan. So it goes deep into what you do. Look, EITC, it's a fantastic example. EIT, earned income tax credit is money that the poor get back for working. So if you're the non-working poor get nothing, but the working poor, at the end of the year, you get a lot of tax back. Technically speaking, EITC is exactly what we used to call welfare. Except that when they came to the ATC, it was brilliant because it's earned income tax credit. A lot of people who are very reluctant to be welfare recipients are very happy to receive earned income. And so you took the exact same program, destigmatized it by calling it earned income, and all of a sudden it's been a major success. So the, the sensitivity of the stigma, the attempts to not show it to your kids, the reluctance to go to receive benefits that are stigmatizing, all that's no doubt a major obstacle. I don't see it necessarily as competing with us, but it's certainly an added load on the board, and a big one. Yes? Uh, couldn't that be in part through like, the purpose of the sneakers, like a uh, route to respectability and consumption? So it's not strictly like, oh, this money is going to go out the window anyways, but because we value consumption in society and want to avoid stigma, instead of critiquing the profile, we should get just trying to be seen as a human who counts, I guess. I mean, I agree. And I think the critic would say, yes, sure, it's nice, but it's still no reason to do it if you have more important things to spend your money on. Uh, I think the same critic should talk to all of us who have you know, BMWs who could have had Honda Accords that just drive just as well for a lot less. So you know, this issue is, goes throughout. But, but it is true that part of it, you know, we were talking about this again earlier, you know, when a poor woman is feeling down and decides to get a manicure, from one side, it sounds completely idiotic. On the other hand, it's going to be the best thing she can do for herself today to feel better over the weekend. And who exactly should be criticizing? It's not really clear. That's exactly the point. I agree. You tell me when, but yeah. Last one. Last one. Um, so uh, you're going to talk about changing the narrative in this country. It's hard to think about that without know, discussing race. And I'm familiar yes. with your work. It was a great job. But you didn't mention any racial effects. Uh, so if you could speak to that and how um, how your work can speak to changing that particular part of it. Uh, fair enough. I, I, didn't talk about, I, I didn't talk about race because I, I don't run studies on race. Uh, the subjects in our studies are actually about equally divided. I also don't talk about race because I don't get it. I just don't understand. I really don't understand it. I think it's something bizarre. Um, the effects are massive, no doubt. Uh, you know, the Brian Stevenson book <laughs> I mentioned, it's all race. Um, there's clearly a massive correlations. Part of the poverty we talk about is not about race. And of course, part of it is made worse by race. The narrative story I'm talking about, I, I, the part of this gay thing, what I learned when we started talking about narrative change, uh, I, I got educated, so I didn't know this, is the story of the LGBT community. It's an amazing story. The book just came out, if you're interested. 
The LGBT community uh, about 30 years ago hired, uh, formed a group called GLAD, the two A's, to basically help them change their image. It's an unbelievable success. If you think about what happened to the LGBT in 30 years, they went from this depraved, hidden thing to a perfectly respectable, wonderful community. Amazing. Um, now, they did something very conscientious. They went to Hollywood. They went to the press. They changed what words newspapers are allowed to use. They worked on programming. They were very systematic and did fantastic stuff. Now, when I want to do GLAD for the poor, the question is how do to compare? And it's a complicated story. So, uh, GLAD, the LGBT, went entirely against all of Christian teachings. The poor, what I'm going to do is exactly what the priest tells you every Sunday. On the other hand, GLAD had very impressive, wonderful, beautiful people in positions of power, and the poor don't have that. GLAD, most of us who heard about GLAD had a cousin, a nephew, a brother, a sister, a friend who was gay or something. Poor, many of us don't. So there's real differences. And race folds into this in complicated ways. So when you talk about the narrative, there's no doubt that the average American, when you talk about the poor, you know, sees uh, a black woman. Of course, the majority of the poor are white. And so there are real complicated issues there. And look, uh, let's talk about it. Uh, everything I did here so far is talk about misunderstanding, naive interpretation, rearranging the narrative. I haven't talked about malice. There was tons of malice, racism, anger, all that. I mean, I'm not talking about this because I have nothing to say about it. I, I can't address it. I don't know how to cure it. I'm just horrified by everybody else, but it's all I've got to say. I think if you distribute the population, and those who do the kind of stuff that Brian Stevenson or Matt uh, Desmond, and those people talk about it, if you got enough of the non-malice people to get it, we'd be in good shape. Uh, I could be wrong about this, but I think the majority are open. Uh, and race is obviously a giant monster in the middle of it all, which again, I, I don't quite understand fully. Uh, there's a wonderful man by the name of John Powell at Berkeley who was interested in, this, in the Gates group and he's educating me, but I'm still not getting it.